Thank you so much for joining me here today on the show. We are going to be going through the absolute best ways to boost growth hormone naturally. So it's something called HGH or human growth hormone, sometimes growth hormone, or sometimes the factor called insulin growth factor one or insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. So you'll see it written in a lot of different ways. We're essentially talking about the same synergies that it provides to the human body. So you might say to yourself, well, growth hormone can be good, it can be bad, right? And I would say to you, that is correct. Anything that you can have um, some of, and it'd be a good thing. If you have too much, it's a bad thing. Now, the main reasons, though, we sometimes have too much IGF-1 would be anabolic steroid use, sometimes too much meat consumption. It's one of the reasons. And again, I'm not saying anything negative about meat. I'm saying it's the total consumption. And sometimes people do go overboard on that as well. But when we think about having too little, we also know that there's massive detrimental effects to having too little growth hormone. It can affect children, it can affect adults and uh, the, I would say, elderly as well. And the reason is that as your growth hormone begins to decline with age, you can see a rapid uh, deterioration of the human body. And that is not what we want. So what we want is always a sweet spot, right? The the want, the goal is always to achieve equilibrium. It's about balance. It's not having too much and it's not having too little. Too much can lead to cancer and other issues. Too little can lead to a rapid, as I said, deterioration of this human body because it is growth hormone that enables us to repair our body. So if you're looking to repair after a workout, after any stressor, believe it or not, cold therapy is a stressor, sauna is a stressor, weight training is a stressor, a boot camp is a stressor, right? Any of these things are stressors in the body. It doesn't mean that they're bad, but you do need to make sure that you're taking in adequate nutrition and you're boosting your growth hormone in order to be able to repair the body. So really important in terms of the overall muscles of the body, important in overall endurance, but it's also important in terms of our overall appearance and skin and hair. So your hair, skin, nails all need HGH or growth hormone in order to be able to turn over, recover, and start to look even more youthful. It's why some people look like they can actually age backwards, meaning like maybe they weren't taking care of themselves for a few years, uh, things started to go a little bit south in terms of their overall energy and their overall endurance and their muscle tone and, and everything to do with their body. Then all of a sudden, they started taking care of themselves. They got in adequate uh, fruits and vegetables, got in adequate uh, protein, and they started to then transform their body, not just from the outside, but the inside as well. But today is not just about nutrition. I actually want to give you many different tips uh, along with nutrition, yes, that can boost growth hormone naturally. And here's the nice thing, that you're really not going to be able to overdo it when you boost it naturally. Because your body knows, your body is a natural governor that stops it from ever really going too high unless there is some type of exogenous, meaning like something brought into the body that would boost it. Maybe maybe like taking growth hormone, of course, right? <laughs> that would boost your levels. Um, taking anabolic steroids can boost your levels. Um, we can talk about workouts, but that's, again, that's far and few between. A lot of red meat could boost your levels. So there are different ways to do this. What I'm going to do is share with you the healthiest, the natural ways, the ways that you can incorporate every single day and should be incorporating this every single day to live a long, strong, healthy life. All right. So the first thing that I want to share with you is right off the bat is talk about intermittent fasting, but not just intermittent fasting, but actually fast of two to three days. Now, I know that sounds like a long period of time, but think about it. Like we have 10,000 people minimum doing the functional medicine detox every 12 weeks. So it's not like you're doing a two to three day fast every day, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that would be impossible. You have to eat at some point. So what are we really talking about? Well, we're saying every three weeks, I'm sorry, every three months, 12 weeks, you're doing two and a half, three days of a longer fast. And I've done a show, and I'll link it up today at stephencabral.com forward slash 2251. That's where all the links will be in the research. Sharing with you that your body, a lot of people talk about autophagy, right? All the benefits of anti-cancer, uh, autophagy, and all these amazing things that it does for both the body and brain. Okay, what 
people don't often talk about is that you don't really get into deep autophagy until at least 36 to 48 hours. And then you're in it, it's deep, it's breaking down cancer cells, necrotic tissue, et cetera. So while I don't recommend a two to three day fast once a week, or really even once a month, unless you're a more robust constitution, I recommend one every 12 weeks. And, and growth hormone's been shown to be increased over 300%, like literally, uh, meaning like you're, when you test your lab levels with that longer fast. So here's another stat that I want to give you though is that you can actually improve growth hormone on a daily basis with a 12 to 16 hour fast. So as your body says, whoa, where'd the food go? Okay, we better shift gears here. It can start to increase growth hormone. You will see a negative effect as the body becomes more catabolic and breaks down and breaks down. So you don't want to overdo this again, like anything, achieving equilibrium. So really, really important. Another factor that I want to add, add in here though is you're going to get the biggest benefits in growth hormone by stopping eating earlier at night, not extending it into the morning hours. I mentioned this a few times now. I'm going to be doing a longevity-based course this fall. But I'll tell you right now, one of the big things that I've seen, it almost beats out everything else. The more hours you fast before going to bed, the better. I mean... In almost every regard, if you want to talk about body temperature, deep sleep, REM, HRV, uh, what else is a huge marker for it? Breath rate, body temperature, growth hormone, you're going to, I'm telling you right now, if you, the, if you eat an hour or two before bed, massive difference between if you stop eating three to four hours before bed. It's massive. My best numbers are the nights where I skip dinner or I have something very light very light meal. It's dramatic. It is honestly one of the most dramatic things that I've seen. Difficult to implement. It's not hard. I mean, like not hard to do. Difficult to implement. Why? Well, the dinner is when you share that typically at the end of the day with a loved one or your family or whatever it might be. So I totally get it. But I'll tell you right now, even if it's only a couple nights a week, just you don't have to skip dinner. Just move it forward dramatic results. So intermittent fasting, overall amazing on a daily basis. Uh, and then that every 12 weeks, a little bit longer of a fast. Another big one is this. So a lot of people say, well, you're going to boost growth hormone by reducing your carbs. That's not necessarily true. None of the statistics prove that out any way, shape, or form besides an overall fast. What it does show is that people with diabetes, so people with higher blood sugar, have far less, three to four times less growth hormone production. I mean, that's a lot, three to four X, than people that do not have impaired insulin. So this is an important factor. It's not about having diabetes or not about having diabetes. It's about controlling insulin. So it's about meaning, or I should say it, it means waking up in the morning with a fasting glucose level below a 95. It's imperative. It's important. You need to do it, right? And it needs to be a part of your program. It also means that you don't have to be afraid of carbohydrates. Your blood sugar just has to come down two to three hours after a meal. And you don't really want to eat more than three times a day. Like, that's the goal. I've talked about this before. You can have fluctuations in blood sugar. You really can. It actually helps to restore, to reduce stress hormones, improve inhibitory neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA. Um, it helps improve thyroid levels. It helps improve leptin levels for fat burning. So it's like... We go wild sometimes with individual studies without looking at the overall human physiology of the body. A lot of people talk about pushing the body to its limits, and I get it, and it's a hardcore way of thinking, and you might even feel good doing it for a certain period of time, but the body has its limits. Again, it's about achieving equilibrium, not breaking the body in one direction. Really important fact to look at. Another one I want to add is this. If we're talking about not eating as close to bedtime as possible, again, you can only do your best, right? So you do your best, is seeing what you can do to increase GABA levels. So GABA, I've talked about before, gamma, aminobutyric acid, amino, sorry, GABA is aminobutyric acid, gamma, aminobutyric acid, easy for me to say, rolls right off the tongue, right? Is that this is a calming and inhibitory neurotransmitter along with serotonin. I'm going to be talking about serotonin in just one moment, but I'm going to talk about it in a different roundabout type of way. 
So GABA is known as more of the anti-anxiety. It helps turn the mind off. It helps put the body at ease, and by that I mean the nervous system. And if you can increase GABA levels, which I've done shows on, on neurotransmitters uh, before, you can allow your body to shift out of the fight or flight and more in the parasympathetic nervous system. And if that will allow you, which it does, to get into deeper sleep, more restorative sleep, you're going to see growth hormone levels increase. Why does this matter? Well, because if you're not able to get eight to nine hours of sleep every night, you need to maximize the sleep that you do get. So in order to do that, you need to make sure that you're doing the right things before bed in order to improve GABA. Meditation, a warm to um, calming bath or shower would work. Epsom salt bath. Uh, some people find a sauna, not overly heating, but sauna to be effective. Put on those blue light blocking glasses. Get rid of the smartphones. Don't watch the news before bed. All the things that are going to calm the brain to then calm the nervous system. You can use a GABA-based product. I'm not against it, but plan on using it maybe for 6 to 12 weeks and then maybe tapering off. The product that I like, I help formulate, and that's at Equal Life. It's called Sleep Help Support. Again, you don't have to use it, but it does contain GABA, and it will help with producing more of those inhibitory neurotransmitters. And the other inhibitory neurotransmitter that we think about the most is serotonin. I'm sure you've probably heard about serotonin before. Not enough of it can lead to depression. But what's often looked at in terms of neuro, the neurotransmitter serotonin, known as the happy, feel-good neurotransmitter, is that it's a precursor to melatonin. Why is this important? Because those people with the best production of melatonin typically get into more deeper restorative sleep and increase their levels of growth hormone naturally. Now, you keep hearing me talk about sleep so much, right? And shifting off the fight or flight. Well, that is when we're producing a lot of this growth hormone, right? That's a lot of times when we're repairing. We're not repairing necessarily when we're in the gym, when we are exercising, when we're under stress. We're doing it overnight. And that's why it's so crucial to turn the body and the brain off from seven at night to seven in the morning. There has to be half the day for go, half the day for off right? And hopefully you can break up that it's not all stress all day long from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. But certainly it's something that you want to look at. It, I mean, it really is, is you have to be able to turn off that nervous system. If not, you'd burn yourself out at just such a young age. And again, I know that because it happened to me at 17. I don't want it to happen to you maybe in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, whatever it might be. So what I recommend is this. Again, for just a period of time, you might do something like our, our sleep help protocol or ultimate sleep help protocol. It's going to give you a little me a melatonin. It's a non-groggy form. It's a liquid-based form. And what you want to do is the lowest possible dose that gets you the best results. That's always the goal with supplements, not the maximum dose, the lowest possible dose that gets you the maximum results possible. We found in our practice that's typically between one milligram and five milligrams. And guess what? That's, that's what lines up exactly with the research because you're not doing these mega doses of 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams. Now, is there a time and place for 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams? Sure. Your body's under stress. Uh, you're having difficulty sleeping at all. You got some type of viral illness. Oh, there's a time and place. But you're only using that for a couple of weeks. That's it. And then you're tapering down. Well, it's the same here. Maybe use this for 6 to 12 weeks, and then you can decide to taper down. Or just use a small dose, right? A little micro dose. Maybe it's 1 milligram to 2.5 milligrams each night. It's maybe 10% of what the body will produce on its own, but it gives you maybe just enough to be able to get that body out of the fight or flight, to be able to knock down cortisol levels and get you in that deeper restorative sleep. These are a few things that you can do on the recovery side, and I've kind of woven in and around it, but actually exercise and weight training during the day can help you later produce more growth hormone the rest of the day. So the weight training that we've seen be the most effective, believe it or not, is high-intensity interval training, sprint training, which is sprint interval training, and it's still a high-intensity form, but it's something done for not a long extended period of time, but actually a short burst that provides essentially maximal resistance on the body, and then there's a period of rest, and you repeat that a couple times. So again, that can look like a weight training routine, or it can look like sprints after your workout. 
A lot of people, and we'll be debuting this in, the, in our new app in about a month from now, we'll do a weight training workout, and it might be 20 minutes, might be 30 minutes maximum. But what they can do afterwards is choose to do three to five sprints. Not a million sprints, right? <laughs> if a little good, if a little is good, then you know a whole lot must be better. Well, that's not the case. Three to five, 20, 40 sprints, so 30, 90 sprints. And you can do that after your workout. It takes you a whole five minutes to 10 minutes. And you can reap a lot of these results of boosting growth hormone. So now you're maximizing your time, you're boosting your anabolic effects, the body's breaking down, but then you're using all of these modalities in order to be able to recover. And one of those recoveries is by boosting growth hormone. Hopefully today's podcast was helpful. I'll be sure to bring more tips like this in the future. Let me know what you thought in the comments. And of course, if this was helpful, please do feel free to share this with anyone you believe it could serve. 